Welcome, buds, to Keeping Carlson Short Shifts, the podcast hosted by two guys who like really short shifts. Uh, my name is Ben Burnett. I'm joined by Lewis Ezekiel. Lewis, what do we think? Will the New York Islanders ever lose a game in regulation again? It is uh, quite impressive. Certainly not if they keep playing against the Penguins. I think we're entering that dismal time of the season where Matt Murray is just a disaster for several weeks and people start to lose faith in him. I'm a Murray owner this year, so I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, It just seems like the Islanders have been able to toy with him lately. Two pretty tight defensive teams who just can't help but run up the score against each other's goalies. Uh, So you're not worried about Murray in the general sense. It's just when he's playing against the Islanders? Well, you know, I'm worried about him entering this phase that he always seems to hit where he kind of sucks for a while in the fall, early winter. I think he'll get it back in. I'm going to try to keep the faith. I ended up selling him last year for Bennington, which worked out fine. Um, But he definitely was uh, really good towards the end of the year last year and probably saved quite a few people's seasons. Yeah, six of his last seven with save percentages 905 or worse. That's not a great run for Matt Murray or his owners. Uh, sorry to hear that, Lewis. So one more thing I want to add on. You know, you introduced us as two guys who like short shifts. Uh, as long as we're on the Keeping Carlson Network, I think I want to plug that I am maybe the only one among us still who is a keeper of Carlson. I don't know how much of a badge of honor that is these days. Um, But certainly we thought he was going to be really good this year. So still holding the faith. I think you, I don't even know if it's out that uh, Brian and Elon aren't still owners of Carlson. So you may have just spoiled the bag for them. I think they frequently call themselves guys who at one point owned Carlson in their keeper leagues. So uh, I... They'll, I'm sure they'll let us know. Yeah, exactly. We'll have to listen this week and find out. Uh, Lewis, you and I are best known for our work on Twitter at AVG Time on Ice. You should follow us there as well as our partner, Jade Bettine. Uh, we like to keep it light. We like to keep it goofy over there, and we hope that you will enjoy that. Uh, we're going to start this episode with some headlines, and we're going to start with the number one headline in the hockey world, much less fantasy hockey. Toronto has finally ditched Mike Babcock. They're playing tonight, and in fact, they're playing as we record right now. They have a lead over the Arizona Arizona Coyotes, one nothing as of this moment. Uh, we've seen some updated power play lines in practice. Tyson Berry is on the top power play in place of Andreas Janssen. Uh, That's the most notable change in value. You know, obviously Janssen a little bit lower, Barry a little bit higher. He finally scored his first goal of the season tonight. Um, In our patron-only Facebook group, which you can join at keepincarlson.com slash patron, uh, come join the discussion, chat with Lewis, Brian, Elon, and I. We talk about fantasy hockey all day, every day. Uh, patron Kevin made a post about the firing and how he sees the change impacting value on all of the players on the Leafs. Hey, buddy, there's my kitty. Uh, I have to say I mostly agree with his uh, takes today. In general, I like the positive impact on the superstars. For example, Austin Matthews should see a little bit more time than just 19 minutes per night. That could spike his value in a really interesting way. Any other big changes in value that stand out to you, Lewis? So the whole hockey world was waiting with bated breath to see what the Leafs were going to do next in their first game under Coach Keefe. Heard a lot of talk over the last day about the Leafs potentially opening things up offensively to play more high-event hockey. I think we'll have to wait until we've got a few games worth of data to decide how true that is. If so, we may be in for some more excitement for those who are holding Leafs skaters with the possible exception of Morgan Riley and Andreas Janssen and possibly a detriment to Freddie Anderson owners who are already quite disappointed, I imagine, if they are sacrificing some of their defensive effort in favor of offensive power. Uh, We'll have lots more to discuss on this after we get a little more data. Uh, In the meantime, congrats Toronto on firing a guy everyone apparently hated but was too scared to say it. Uh, After crowing to Detroit fans about all the cups he was going to win behind your bench as you backed a Brinks truck up to his place, Uh, way to go. I I personally don't really necessarily assume that Riley is going to be on the 
downturn just because Barry's going to get this shot. Uh, I think it's great for Barry and especially those who have been sticking with him. If you've been holding on to Tyson Barry, finally you may have that bet be about to pay off, and I'd be pretty excited about that. But overall, I do think Morgan Riley is the better power play defenseman, and I would expect or at least hope that he'll manage to hold on to that spot. Yeah, I see your point there. And Janssen really hasn't been doing much of anything lately, so it may be uh, addition by subtraction by getting Janssen off that line and getting Barry up there. Maybe they can make some magic together. Yeah, I mean, Andreas Janssen kind of in a tough spot there in that net front spot. Even like Nazem Kadri hasn't been cleaning up in that spot in his years there. It's just hasn't been a traditionally productive spot uh, for that net front guy on the power play. Let's move right along. We're going to update a story we chatted about on Wednesday morning show. Nikita Kucherov missed the game tonight. The reigning heart winner has 18 points in the season's first 19 games. Somehow a disappointing stat line. Uh, in his place, Andre Palat has joined Stamkos and Point at even strength. And the top power play uh, hadn't been on the ice after Kucherov left the game on Tuesday night. But it looks like Alex Kalorn and Tyler Johnson were on the power play today. Any interest in Palat? Johnson or Kalorn while Kucherov is out? So I'm always a little bit interested in Palat. I think he's been a, a, a nice streamer uh, frequently over the past, although he does run pretty hot and cold. Uh, he seems to take advantage when he's got an improved deployment opportunity, so I would keep an eye on him. That said, this is not your baby brother's Tampa team of the last couple of years that have been blowing out uh, teams with five or six goals every game. If you've got a clear streamer spot, Palat or a TJ, I think, make it an interesting grab. Um, but I don't think I would be dropping anyone above maybe a 50-point pace uh, for a kucherov list top liner or power play participant. Lewis, this metaphor, isn't it usually your baby brother's if it's worse? Well, I was thinking, you know, you say your dad's, uh, this isn't your dad's Tampa Bay team, but really we're talking about Tampa Bay's team <laughs> of, like, last year or the year before. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So uh, you've made this up, is what you're saying. <laughs> well, I, I'll admit to uh, regretting it somewhat after it came out of my mouth there. But, uh, you know, uh, what are you going to do? I love it. And uh, it's taking the world by storm. Everyone's talking about their baby brother's team. Moving Leave it on. in. <laughs> I'm leaving it in. There's no way I'm not. Uh, moving on, we're going to chat about some... Injuries and outeries in the lineup in Pittsburgh. Honestly, Lewis, this is a milestone. It's the first time I've ever used the word outeries. I've only ever heard it coming through my headphones from Elon and Brian. Feeling uh, feeling proud right now. Feeling excited. And what an outery to discuss. What an outery to discuss. Patrick Hornquist is back, and he notched a goal in... Uh, tonight's game against the New York Islanders on my fantasy team, which I'm very excited about. On the out on the injury. And, and I'm already forgetting which one is which. On the injury side, uh, Justin Schultz and Nick Bukestad are now out. Schultz, of course, the more fantasy relevant defenseman, is being dubbed a longer term injury, while Crosby and Latang remain on the shelf. They had two power play opportunities Thursday night, and the first one went to Dumoulin, the second one went to Pedersen. Lewis. Any thoughts on fantasy-relevant players in Pittsburgh with the injury bug still buzzing rampantly? Did I mention I had some short-term concerns about Matt Murray's viability? I don't think having a, a defense core that looks like it has crawled out of a World War One trench is going to be very beneficial for him overall. Um, I did grab Pedersen last night uh, just on a wild guess that I hoped that he would end up on that power play. So pleased to see that he ended up on the second one. Um, but it certainly seems like it might end up being kind of a coin flip between Pedersen, Dumoulin, and John Marino as guys who could take the job any given game or even shift. Uh, Dumoulin and Marino were the defensemen who ended up with assists tonight for whatever that is worth. Yeah, I am a little bit disappointed to see that Hornquist didn't get back on that top power play right away. I'd like to see him there over Brian Rust. Uh, he's been successful in the past, but how do you take off a guy who's been as hot as Brian Rust has been the last few weeks? Yeah, potted another goal this evening. 12 points in the 11 games that Rust has been back from injury on the season. Playing on a line with Malkin and Gensel, if he is available in any of your leagues, you need to go and grab him. Still owned in under 30% of leagues. That is kind of wild to me. None of the ones I'm in, obviously. And I imagine he's got to be pretty close to 100% owned in the Cup Cupful leagues. 
Yes, the Cacupful, of course, the Keeping Carlson Ultimate Patron Fantasy League, a league made up of patrons of Keeping Carlson, which you can become one as well. We are currently filling up the waiting list, and Lewis and I have been needling Brian and Elon about starting a new division with the wait list. So why don't you folks show your support for short shifts? Go and join that wait list by becoming a patron at keepingcarlson.com slash patron. Lewis, we are going to move right into today's Patron 5. Speaking of the Keeping Carlson patron group, why don't you explain the concept behind the Patron 5? So basically on Thursday mornings, we put up a poll with an opportunity for uh, patrons to vote for players uh, that they would like to hear about. Uh, They nominate anyone that they are interested in getting a little bit of a deeper dive, and we are selecting from among the top choices. Starting with number five, and this is a player who I've written about on Dauber Hockey, where I have a I write the Geek of the Week column every Sunday. This is my uh, disgusting son, Brady Kachuk. I say that with love, of course. Um, so Brady has gotten off to a start that is very similar to last year's point pace with 13 points through 21 games for a pace of just over 50 points. I uh, actually wrote about a few weeks ago how I thought that Brady was due to trend upwards and I went back and looked at some of those numbers Uh, something that I had mentioned at that point that has continued is the elite shot rate that Kachuk has had at even strength he currently in fact and this this kind of blew my mind Lewis Brady Kachuk leads the league in shot rate shots per 60 at even strength with 13.46 shots every 60 minutes. He's on the ice nearly a full shot ahead of the second place skater, Brendan Gallagher. That's that's wild. That is so to hear a second year player is putting that many pucks on net is wonderful. He's also 14th in hits per 60, meaning that if you're in a multi-cat league, I don't even think you have a right to be disappointed. He's just been so good at filling categories every single night that the Senators play. The one caveat with all of this, I'm, I'm kind of bubbling over with excitement for Brady Kachuk, but the one caveat, unfortunately, is that the Senators power play is bad, has been bad, and is likely to continue to be Bad. Brady Kachuk has done all of that without putting up a single power play point. The Sens are 29th in the league on the power play shooting percentage. And I'm not really even certain that that's going to get that much better. Like, of course, the Sens are in the bottom five of the league in power play shooting percentage. Why would they be any higher? Brady, you know, definitely isn't going to have a 0% IPP on the power play for the full season. They've scored three goals while he's been on the ice, and he's been in on none of them. So I'd anticipate that that number regresses. It should be closer to five goals, four, and uh, three power play points for Brady, I think, if if we were looking at a more normalized shot percentage, on ice shooting percentage, and IPP. So if we look at all those numbers together, I'd say that Brady probably finishes the year running closer to a 60-point pace while maintaining that elite peripheral production. Lewis, what do you think? Brady Kachuk, you still in on him? Did I, have I convinced you that he's worth holding on to? Oh, certainly. I think anytime you're talking about a guy who is shooting at rates comparable to Brendan Gallagher, when that is, you know he's the poster boy for high shot rates, I think that's really exciting. Something that might put some juice in that Ottawa power play is we did finally see John Gabriel Pajot uh, pick up some power play time for himself, uh, and this is some you know a guy who inexplicably has just been left off of that power play any power play unit uh, for the first month and a half of the season so it would be really cool to see him get going on the power play and maybe he can help Brady Kachuk one other thing about Brady that I have to point out is someone on Twitter uh, drew the comparison that he looks just like the bully from a Christmas story and I cannot get it out of my head Uh, I'm hoping that he can get in a fight with a much smaller player like maybe uh, Tyler Johnson uh, and the two of them can really go at it and Tyler will sit on his face or sit on his chest and just wail on his face (laughs) <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't have anything to say to that. I agree. I hope that that happens. Uh, let's move on to number four on the Patron 5. Lewis, why don't you tell us a player that you dove into tonight? 
All right, so another player that the patrons wanted to hear about is Morgan Frost. A ton of excitement uh, around Philly with the addition of Frost to the goal man. He is off to a blistering start with two goals and an assist in his two games. After the game, uh, the graphics department ran a banner at the bottom of the screen that listed the NHL all-time leader in goals per game for Morgan Frost with one per game, followed by Mike Bossy at 0.76 and Mario Lemieux at 0.75 with the additional comment, save your sample size comments. I thought that was pretty excellent work from the graphics department there. Uh, We really have no sample size to speak of, but he's being put in a fantastic spot to succeed between uh, Konechny and Giroux at even strength and on the power play. Dabber Prospects ranks him as a player with eventual 85% possibility, and while I don't see him pacing that way for the remainder of this season, especially only playing 15 minutes a night, he's obviously off to a great start in that regard. One item that does have me concerned about Frost is that the top line has been suffering in the 5v5 shot attempts. Uh, Their most recent game, they only managed a 24% Corsi 4 uh, so, meanwhile, that Couturier line was at 71.4% of their shot attempt rate at even strength. It's tough to argue with success, though, and it does seem like the Flyers might try to keep that talent spread out, uh, and hopefully Frost can you know, get his legs under him at even strength as he adjusts to the NHL game. If you've got an open streamer spot, you know, your window your window to get in early on this action is closing. He could be a great add in the short term and down the road could serve as useful trade bait like an Olafson type uh, or continue to be valuable for your team longer than that. Everybody loves a shiny new toy. Uh, so what do you think? You have some players that might uh, be, you know, droppable on your rosters to grab a Morgan Frost? I'm going to be honest with you, Lewis. I'm glad that you took Morgan Frost because I would be the grumpiest man about him of all time. This is just like the opposite of the sort of player that I target. Um, first of all, on a team coached by Alain Vigneault, a noted line juggler, Morgan Frost's entire fantasy relevance depends on him holding on to deployment that he is in no way able to prove that he's going to hold on to. So I am, I am the Scrooge on Morgan Frost. I am disinterested in him entirely. However, I've obviously been burned by being this grumpy in the past, so if I did happen to have some space on my roster, I could see it as a streamer especially. I'm not good, I'm not too proud to add a top line top power play type forward, but overall I do expect him to go the way of the Faraby and become a middle to bottom sixer within the first 10 games of his career. Alan Vigneault is just too impulsive not to to keep him up on that top unit so let me ask would you take a newly demoted andreas jansen or a newly ascendant morgan frost i would prefer to add morgan frost in the short term with the understanding that it's likely to see here's the issue that i have lewis is that i am in canada meaning that all of my leagues feature ridiculous maple leafs homers so i have andreas jansen in some leagues i'm gonna go and trade him to somebody like i i as opposed to adding morgan frost off the waiver wire so maybe once i turn andreas jansen into a third round pick i can go out and get morgan frost but for now it's uh for now it's morgan frost season as far as you know, I'm going to pick him over a guy who's not getting top top deployment, but I just don't trust it in a in a season long capacity. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's hear about our number three guy. Absolutely, and I mentioned my garbage son Brady Kachuk earlier. Now we're going to talk about my beautiful Finnish son Capo Kako. Capo started really cold and put up only two points in the first nine games of his NHL career. He's turned on the heater in the past eight games, though, with eight points over that stretch. We've also seen him hop up to power play one and improve his shot rate from the early season. Those are both excellent developments, and I have to take a pause here because... The last thing I wanted to do when prepping this show is to say negative things about Capo Caco. So this is it, folks. If you can't handle hearing bad things about Capo Caco, I'm going to warn you to jump ahead about a minute and a half here. There are things to be concerned about when it comes to Capo. Uh, First of all, a lot of things could change with deployment, especially if and when Zabanajad comes back. 
you know, I've been saying this for weeks now, and he continues to not come back. So it's not like I'm, you know, not worried at all about Zibanejad's health. I definitely am. But at some point, you would have to assume the Rangers' best center will return. But beyond even that, it's all it's not really a great sign from an underlying stats perspective when Capo is putting up the third worst shot rate among forwards who have played over 200 even strength minutes. He's third worst in Corsi 4 percentage. He's third worst in shots 4 percentage and by expected goals, he is the worst forward in the league. He has flashed some skills, and I'm not worried about him in a long-term sense. You know, the Rangers, they're a bad team by expected goals, by shot rates. I'm not expecting a rookie to just jump in and become elite. However, when it comes to this season, I don't really want to bet on a guy who's giving up 80 shots against, shot attempts against over every 60 minutes that he's on the ice. I would expect a, a severe slowdown is ahead for my Finnish son, Capo Caco. Barring some big changes in New York, I see him finishing at around a 45-point pace. Is that too low? You know, I think any time that you're dealing with a rookie, uh, you can never, you know, I think you got to kind of put a hard cap on on their possibilities outside of the super elite. Uh, with those numbers, I'm trying to imagine how... Uh, he might be faring if Vigneault was still behind the bench in New York, uh, you know, having uh, shot against numbers up in that range. These Rangers are just so bad. I mean, we've talked about Philly Heat quite a bit the past few weeks. He leads the team in Corsi 4 percentage at 49 percent so this is a team where no one is you know no one is skating above the line it's not like i expect capo to be putting up amazing sterling numbers on a team that's obviously not coaching the players to put up elite shot possession numbers but it's just not a very promising sign when all of his points are dependent on him sticking on that top unit and i could definitely see a shuffle coming in the future Uh, So let's move on to the number two player on our patron five. Patrons want to know about Martin Nikash. Uh, Nikash has been a really interesting guy to watch this year on Carolina's third line. Uh, He was part of that really nice line with Haula uh, and showed some really good chemistry before Haula got hurt. Uh, And surprisingly, his absence hasn't slowed Nikash down much. He's got nine points in his last 10 games despite playing around 14 minutes a night. Uh, with some limited power play time. That time on ice does have me a little bit concerned, and there are a couple other stats that have me a little bearish on Nikash. Uh, His IPP is way up at 84.6%, and while this mark does represent the lowest of his career, the only other IPP we have to compare uh, is last year's 100% IPP in his rookie year, based off of a single goal and an assist. His personal shooting percent and his on-ice shooting numbers are normal, but he's about a goal ahead of his individual expected goals, which is worse than it sounds when you only have three total, so really he's scoring close to 50% uh, more goals than we would expect. I see him as a guy who's closer to 50 points or maybe even uh, 48 than the 56 that he's on pace for. Neither of these numbers are especially exciting outside of 12 to 14 team leagues, but I might watch out uh, for when Howla comes back. Uh, he's been able to put up these numbers uh, in a you know relatively less uh, advantageous position uh, with his beginning of the year line made injured. Uh, if and when Howlett does return, uh, he might be someone that I would take a look at to potentially stream in. Yeah, and I mean, for deeper leagues, I agree with you, Martin Nikash is obviously more interesting there. But we are talking about a 20-year-old rookie, like a 50 to 55-point pace. Not too bad for somebody coming into his first full year in the league. This is a team that has shown that that they're willing to move young players up the lineup if they can perform, as we've seen with Andrei Svechnikov this year. So hopefully we get to see him with a little bit more time on ice. Currently playing under 14 minutes a night, it's tough to be fantasy relevant with those numbers. I like Martin Nikosh, especially in a keeper and dynasty leagues. But yeah, he's definitely a tough hold in a more shallow one-year league. Definitely, I agree. 
All right, Lewis, we have time for one more player. And somehow I had to talk about my favorite team. And I have also decided to speak about one of your favorite team's players. The patrons want to know about Dylan Larkin and know about Dylan Larkin. They are going to get. So uh, the number one center in Detroit, somehow on pace for only 55 points Despite getting the same deployment as last year, I think most people were expecting he'd be up in that 80, 85 point range. Unfortunately, there are a few numbers that don't look too crazy, including his shooting percentage. You know, it's a little low at 8%, but that's nothing that would be unfathomable for Dylan Larkin, who put up an under 10% shooting percentage a couple years ago. Uh, The shot rate is also down at even strength and on the power play. But again, it's nothing that's too, it's not like he's shooting half the amount he used to. It just looks like maybe over 82 games, he may shoot about 30 shots less than he did last year. Uh, What is crazy is his super low IPP. So on the power play, he's getting in on only 25% of the goals, and I would expect that to be closer to 60%. For a guy who is the clear superstar on his team's power play, that thing should run through him, and I would imagine that it, it does over the rest of the season. At even strength, the team is shooting a little high, and that is bound to regress from 11.4%. However, his even strength IPP is also low at only 50%. I think that should be a lot closer to 75. So I think he is actually a true point-per-game player like we thought preseason. He's just been on the unlucky side of the numbers and not been getting in on all of the goals that he should have just on an average stats basis. Uh, So I think he's bound to regress up to that point pace. Given that he is locked into that top power play unit and locked into that top line role with no internal competition, I think he's bound to figure this out. And so my advice is to go out and buy Dylan Larkin now, especially if you can get him at a 55 point pace. He is an obvious buy. So go and get him. What do you think about that buy low? We, We talked about buy lows the other day. What do you think about that one? Yeah, so I think you might be hard pressed to be able to buy him as a fifty-five point player unless you agreed can strike the name off when you make your offer. But I see your point, uh, and I think you are on track. Like if you can get him for a sixty, sixty-five point guy right now, um, I think you'll it'll pay dividends ultimately. I almost never draft Red Wings, and this year I had the opportunity to grab Larkin, so I blame myself uh, for bringing this upon us. Um, I think that it is crazy. Those numbers that you brought up to me, I was unaware of them until I saw them in the deck. Uh, But just with the dearth of talent in Detroit, to see so few goals going through Larkin uh, boggles the mind when you have the likes of Dennis Chalowski on your power play. Uh, So, yeah, I think uh, I would love to see him obviously get in on a few more of them as a Larkin owner myself. Uh, And if you can... Get him in a trade. I say get out there and and shoot your shot. Try and get this guy on your team. Yeah, I mean, I said if you can get him at a 55-point pace, but I would go as far as trading a 65, 70-point player. Nick Schmaltz, for example, is on pace for 67 points on the year. A player like Andre Burakovsky is on pace for about 70. These are obvious guys that I would rather have Dylan Larkin than. How about you, Lewis? Would you trade either of those guys for Dylan Larkin? Yeah, and if you have some suggestions for players that you think would be good buy low offers, uh, yeah, get us on Twitter at AVG Time on Ice. We'd love to hear about it. And with that, folks, we are done for today's short shifts episode. My name is Ben Burnett. I hope you will join me at keepingcarlson.com slash patron. Come and join our Facebook group on Saturday. We will be hosting our second Saturday stream. It's going to be me. It's going to be Jade Bettine. We're just going to be answering all of your questions on a Facebook live stream. It was super fun last week. It's going to be just as fun, maybe even more fun this week. For myself, Ben Burnett, I'm signing out of here. Lewis, why don't you read us out? All right, so thank you to Natural Stat Trick, Fan Tracks, Dauber Prospects, uh, Left Wing Lock, Daily Faceoff, and Yahoo for help with our research. Thank you all for tuning in. We so appreciate you checking out our show. Uh, Please feel free to let us know on Twitter how you think things are going, what you might like to hear. Uh, any feedback that you may have for us. And in the meantime, play smart and keep your shifts short.